Well, hello and welcome to Talk Time. Now, this week we have a very, very special guest. And uh, we're going to talk about the National Democratic Congress. What is the state of the party today? What does the future hold for the party? What are some of the difficulties confronting the people who run that party? And we may also veer into talking about uh, the Kwesibotri report. There are all kinds of rumors about the Kwesibotri report. Which of these rumors are true and which of them are not true? Are all the rumors false? Welcome to Talk Time. What are you looking for? Now come God takes all. Greatness down to the door. Yeah, my feet are sore. Best bargains on our things. Everything here is about gain. High quality. Put me a priority. So tell your mom. Tell Kobe. Tell your actually everybody. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, we are going to talk about the National Democratic Congress. We will be talking about its perspectives on the last four months. Has the new administration done well? Has it failed? How has it performed? What about the National Democratic Congress itself? What is its current state? What does the future hold for it? And, and so many other things. And we are particularly privileged to have with us in the studio Mr. Johnson Asidu Inketia, alias Mosquito. So you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes, yeah. So what is the state of the National Democratic Congress? Thank you very much and uh, good evening to listeners. I'm very impressed. This is my first time of um, coming to this studio. And uh, I can assure you that I'll try and make it a habit. Now to the question of the state of National Democratic Congress. Everybody knows that um, as a political party, when you go into battle and you suffer defeat, um, you cannot say that the state of the party is as good as you wish it to be, otherwise you wouldn't lose elections. So, but having said that, um, we know, we in National Democratic Congress know that uh, in democracy, when you go for elections, it's either win or lose. So that shouldn't be anything too special. So I'll say that we've organized, first there was initial shock, but uh, as at now, we seem to have gotten over um, the biggest, uh, you know, shock. We are putting our act together. You know, we've um, <coughs> put out the committee to go around listening to our supporters and, uh, you know, the general public at large and to advise and recommend the way forward so that when we identify what went wrong, we'll be able to put the party on a better uh, footing to fight and win the next election. So that's where we are. Our minority in parliament is not doing badly. They, they've they've uh, uh, picked up so impressively and they are doing their work. As the committee is working, the National Executive Committee has also been meeting and still strategizing as to um, agreeing on the timetable for uh, our activities. You know, this year should be a very busy year for the, for the party. In our constitution, we need to elect a flag bearer 24 calendar months before the next election. And since we don't just get up to go straight to the election of the flag bearer, you need to go through the whole process of internal elections that will culminate 
into the election of a flag bearer. So we're just waiting for uh, recommendations from Professor Boche's committee, and then we will hit the road running, beginning <laughs> with our, our um, branch elections, and then upgrading to constituency elections, and then regional elections, national elections, before we can go in to do our pal uh, parliamentary and presidential primaries. How can you say that we are waiting for the Kwesi report when the media is supposedly carrying, uh, you know, publishing a 67-page report <laughs> of the Kwesi committee? I was, I, was, I was surprised when <laughs> I saw something like that. But I wasn't uh, completely surprised because it came at a time that MPP seemed to have their back to the wall. And knowing MPP for what they are, Whenever there is any difficult um, media publication, they try to find some balancing, uh, <laughs> do some balancing act. So <laughs> I, I guess that is coming from the, the false news factory. They just put it out there so that whether it is true or not, the act of uh, denying it we also occupy some media space so that the whole media space is not taken over by discussions about the, the Bugli Nabu scandal. Hmm. Are, are you saying emphatically that Dr. Kwesibote has not finished his work or that he has not presented the report to you? He hasn't started writing the report. They've gone around, um, they've finished the, the interviews. And in fact, as at the day before the publication, I was with, it, with them at a meeting and they were now thinking about how the structure uh, and form that the report will take. So if anybody is quoting from a 67 page or 68 page report, that cannot be true. But this report is virtually in, in, in half the newspapers. Well, that's why I'm telling you it's orchestration. MPP wants something to divert attention from a series of scandals that they have been having of late. You know about the $2.5 billion <laughs> scandal <laughs> and then lately this uh, murder of uh, Mahama and so on. So we, we've operated with MPP long enough to know what they are capable of doing when they are in trouble. So I think that that is just some diversionary tactics. We've also seen in the media posters of leading members of your party mm -hmm. apparently beginning a campaign for a presidential slot. Where is that also coming from? At least there's been a poster <laughs> of uh, Alban <laughs> Badin and so on. I wish I knew, but <laughs> you, see, you and I were born at a time when these things were not happening before <laughs> computer. Now, <laughs> every uh, school child can just take your head and take my, <laughs> my, my bust and then put them together and say there's somebody here who wants A, B, C, or D. So when you see those things in the media, it is very difficult at leadership level to conclude that indeed this is uh, genuine or this is false. It's very difficult to know which is genuine and which is false. But whatever it is, uh, we are not disturbed at all. I have said it several times over that why is it that all the other minority parties, the media is not interested in who leads those parties. And even after these elections, I haven't heard anybody talking about the potential leader of PPP or NDP or uh, P PNC, CPP. Why is it that it is NDC that um, people uh, appear to be struggling to lead? And why is it that when any name pops up, it, it generates uh, that much interest in the media? And the, and, the, and the truth of the matter is that people appear in these early days, not to be satisfied with uh, the type of governance that Nakufadu is providing. And so they are eager to look for an, uh, a, a substitute. And so that's how come when they, and that can, the alternative government can only, in, real, in, in reality, can only be provided by NDC. And that is why 
people are interested in who leads NDC. So what I'm are the states of uh, accusations and counter accusations in the party? Who caused the loss of the elections? Who did what and so on? Why? Is it normal? Yes, it is normal. Whenever there is, we, we always say that uh, uh, success has many parents, but defeat is an orphan. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you go into an activity and you win, everybody will be beating their chest. I'm the one who is responsible for us winning. I played this role, but for this thing, we wouldn't have won and so on. Many, many people, even those outside the party, would want to claim uh, you know, responsibility for the victory. But when things go bad, it takes only courageous <laughs> men to, to, to own up, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and then accept responsibility. So I am not surprised about that. Any party that goes into elections and, and then gets defeated will suffer that type of thing. And I don't think that what is happening or what has been happening in NDC is, um, is, is something new. In fact, in Labour Party in UK, you heard it being said when MPP lost elections in Ghana, the same things were said. The NDC itself, um, after our first defeat in 2001, the same things happened. So nothing is happening now in NDC that has not happened before, either in its own history or in the history of other political parties that have gone through similar experiences. But sir, even if it's normal, mm -hmm. it has a potential of affecting the party and its reorganization. What are you doing about the current state? Thank you very much. You see, uh, no particular uh, uh, you know, situation is either beneficial or detrimental. It depends on the response of leadership to a particular situation. If you go into elections and you, uh, you are defeated, it gives you opportunity to know where your mistakes mm -hmm. were, to reassess your organization. And then through that assessment, you'll be able to uh, discover certain shortcomings. It could even happen that you've been living with those shortcomings, but except that Providence <laughs> gave you victory <coughs> in certain circumstances, so it didn't, it didn't trigger any fresh look at those things. So now that we've gone into defeat, I see um, challenges as the raw materials for progress. So when you go into challenges like that, it gives you opportunity to um, review the activities of your organization, assess the organization's strengths and so on vis-a-vis -vis the tax ahead. You, you take a second look at uh, what your core beliefs are, were they uh, upheld in your previous government, and so on, so many things. So it, it is giving us opportunity for us to, if you like, um, reinvigorate the party and then retune it, rebrand, and so on, so that uh, we can face the emerging challenges. Because if you, the formula for <laughs> madness is doing the same things, <laughs> the same way, and expecting different results. Mm. Now, sir, <clears throat> if you take a look at your constitution, yeah. based on your constitutional provisions, what kind of timetable can we expect? Just based on the constitution. What does the constitution say should be done up to the elections? Uh, thank you, Kwesi. Um, this brings me to this whole uh, discussion about uh, people calling for early congress and, and all that. And when you, you, you <coughs> indicate that the constitution itself calls for early congress in these circumstances then some people say oh, we are not talking about the type of early congress that that is provided for in the constitution and i say okay then which other type of early <laughs> congress I, I, I <laughs> that's the point so how can you be doing how can you be throwing your constitution away and then be doing something else and unfortunately some of the people who are making those calls 
uh, lawyers, some of them are lecturers in law. And so when you ask, what else do you mean by early Congress? Then they, 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 they can't find answers. The truth of the matter is that the framers of our constitution had a lot of foresight into this sense. Um, we believe that there must be a different timetable for the party's elections when you are in power and then another one when you are out of power. When you are in power, the demands of um, governance makes it very difficult for you to elect a flag bearer uh, two years or so um, before the election. Because if you go into elections and you happen to elect a different person from <laughs> your president as the flag bearer, mm -hmm. and you have him two years before the election, you can imagine the challenges that it no. will pose. And so, and, and at the same time, if you have another party in power, and you delay the election of your candidates uh, to a, uh, such that you, you just get your candidate in the last year into the elections, it also comes with difficulties because the new candidate will now have time, find time to go around to market himself, you know, develop his thinking for a manifesto to be, to be developed and so on and so forth. So the framers of our constitution provide, uh, have provided clearly that uh, when we are in government, we elect our candidate within 12 months to the uh, subsequent election. But when we are out of government, we elect our candidate 24 calendar months before the election. And uh, as I indicated uh, earlier, we, our elections, internal elections, are progressive. They begin from the grassroots. The, the, the unit or building block of our party is the branch. And the branch is, uh, exists around the polling station area. So now that we have um, close to 30,000 polling stations, it tells you that we will be electing executives for all these 30,000 uh, branches throughout the country. And uh, then after that, we pick delegates from the branches to come and uh, constitute electoral colleges for the constituencies. And then after constituencies, we pick again uh, delegates to form the electoral college that will elect regional and then uh, mm -hmm. up to national. Uh, we also are different from MPP in another respect. We have um, certain organs of the party that are semi-autonomous as far as elections, elections of their leadership are concerned. Um, we can talk about the youth wing. The youth wing, we believe that they, uh, whatever concerns all must be decided by, by all. So we, did, we don't think that it is proper for everybody to be part of uh, the process that elects the leadership for our youth wing. In the same way, we don't think that men should vote when we are electing the leadership of our women's wing. So we hold separate and parallel elections from constituency to national before we come and do the National Congress. At the constituency level, we select branch women organizers. As for the branches, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are nucleus in the sense that we like the nine member executives of a branch, uh, which includes chairman, uh, secretary, women organizer, youth organizer, organizer, and so on, all of them in that nine member in a particular area, polling station area. So they are there forming the, the building block of the party in all the uh, you know, branches throughout the country. And then from there, you now select branch women organizers of all the branches. They will constitute the electoral college that will elect the uh, constituency woman organizer. And the same way, 
the youth branch youth organizers come together to f uh, to elect the constituency youth organizer. Mm -hmm. Then we take it from there up to regional level. The constituency youth organizers come together and they elect the regional youth organizer and the two deputies. Then uh, uh, the same thing happens to the women's wing, and then we get to the um, national, the level. national level. There is a national women's congress for just the women's wing of our party and then we we do national youth congress just for the youth wing of our party where delegates are selected as i have indicated plus the party's branches on the uh, campuses of the tertiary uh, institutions mm -hmm. So they all come together and elect national youth organizer and the two deputies. And the other side also will elect national women's organizer and her two deputies. Mm -hmm. So they are elected. They are the only national executive that, uh, that are elected before the, the party's main national congress. So at <coughs> our main national congress, we don't now elect a youth organizer. We elect the other officers and then we mm. swear all of them in together and then out of that we constitute uh, the various uh, committees so all these things must happen before we go into the election of our candidates both parliamentary and presidential this should take about two years no we think that uh, we can do all this and get our flag bearer in by the end of uh, next year 2018. 2018 at least that is what the law says by december and 2018 that's in compliance with the, with the, with the, with the, the law with the, with the constitution yeah mm. has the former president given any indication any mm -hmm. indication that is likely to come back no as far as i am concerned he hasn't given any indication one way or the other he hasn't given any indication no, that he's not, coming. he's not coming and he hasn't given indication that he's coming and i agree with him because what we are doing now we don't want to make the situation more complicated by people like him and others declaring their intentions because you are now going to elect uh, branch executives and so on and so on and the bane of the organization of NDC has been that where and whenever people at constituency level declare their intention to contest elections before we begin branch elections mm -hmm. <coughs> then the same people because according to our law it is the constituency people who go there to organize. organize the branch election mm -hmm. so they go there trying to influence the system in their favor because if i'm going to be uh you know constituency secretary and i or constituency youth organizer i must be interested in who gets elected as <laughs> branch youth organizers uh, throughout that constituency and if you are not careful you find yourself in a situation of conflict of interest mm -hmm. you go trying to put obstacles in the way of otherwise very competent people who could have been elected but because you think that they are not likely to vote for you so that is why i think that for 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 once um the former president and the others to take their time let the party process look for uh, people because of their competence to perform in the various roles to which they are being elected to rather than electing people because you know they are going to form electoral college to get you elected as a president if you did that then after your election as a presidential candidate you now have a very weak party because people who get elected if it is not on the basis of their competence and they are just being elected because they will support one candidate or the other 
they also see themselves as having the sole function of getting a particular presidential candidate elected. <laughs> Beyond that, mm -hmm. if they don't perform <laughs> uh, in their various roles, how can you go beyond Adabraka to the flat staff house? Mm -hmm. It becomes a problem. So that's why I have always advised that people should shelve their interests and let us work on the party uh, uh, you know, structures and get them in battle ready position so that anybody who emerges as a flag bearer can have the likelihood of winning to become a president. Otherwise, if you have a strong flag bearer with a very weak party, I don't see how you can become president. Well, viewers, we are in conversation with the man himself, General Mosquito. Otherwise known as Johnson, <laughs> as in Nketia, and then we are talking about the National Democratic Congress. We're going to go for a short break, and when we come back, I'd like to find out from him what his reaction is to, I think, two or three people who have already declared their intention to contest for the presidential elections. Short break. It's a beautiful day I'm gonna make most of it It's a beautiful day A day to share with you You'll make my world go round Yeah, yeah, yeah It's really got me saying Nice girl Happiness brings home happiness. Experience the wide range of top quality and affordable electronics, phones, tablets, home and office appliances from NASCO. NASCO bring home happiness. Hello, welcome back to Top Time, and we are in conversation with the man himself, Mr. Johnson Asiedu Nketia, alias. General Mosquito. And we are talking about the National Democratic Congress and we are talking also about the national situation. Now, sir, it appears that two, I think it's two people in your party, they are the only people who have had the courage to declare publicly that they are going to run for president. I'm talking about uh, Namwali and another guy, the one who was uh, charged with contempt of court before the Supreme Court, young man, mm. they have been very courageous and they said that, look, they are going for the presidential candidature. What is, how do you see the situation in the light of all the things that you have said? I think that uh, they may be testing some waters, but uh, it is not we haven't gone anywhere near the period for, uh, you know, uh, declaration of intentions and, and so on. And so I don't think that it has any impact on anything that <laughs> we are doing. <laughs> I don't think so. Because first of all, the national executives, constituency executives, who would be laying down the modalities for the elections and receiving and declaring um, vacancies open for which people will declare intentions to contest. They are not in place yet. We, the current executives, are now going to face re-election. It may or may not happen that you won't find the same uh, people there. And so we haven't begun talking about what will go into <laughs> the guidelines for the election and, and so on, when the timetable, uh, you know, is going to be released and so on. So I think that it is too early for anybody to talk about that. So And because of that, I don't consider that they are seriously, uh, you know, intending what they are advertising. Will General Mosquito run again? <laughs> it is too early 
<laughs> for, me, for me to talk about it because you want to put me in the same trap. <laughs> I'm accusing like other people. <laughs> no, I, I always, if you have watched, but me, general, if you are I'm not, if always, not running, uh, it's so easy to say, I'm not running. Uh, listen. If one politician says that it's not yet time and so on, the impression mm. is that they are running. No, it is not always like that. Oh, okay. You know, I, I occupy a particular position that makes conflict of interest very, very uh, likely as far as my <clears throat> contest for elections are concerned. So if you have watched me for all the years that have gone into elections, re-elections and so on, I'm always the last person in the party to declare my mm -hmm. intention. The reason being that the Constitution gives a special role for the General Secretary to play in the elections, in the internal party elections. And so you will be compromising your position by declaring your interest either to contest or not to contest. If you declare your interest not to contest, that makes you a lame duck too early in the day. And so you don't get the authority to, uh, you know, do what you are supposed to do constitutionally. If you, if you decide that uh, you are going to contest, now if you are going to organize uh, constituency elections, regional elections, and so on, everybody, even with the best of your goodwill, everybody will see you as uh, going to select people who will then come to vote for you. Mm -hmm. That is why I always reserve that decision to the last minute. There's been some discussion in your party mm -hmm. about whether the processes of electing the flag bearer should be reviewed. I understand that you elect a flag bearer on the basis of universal adult suffrage. Mm -hmm. Now some people are calling for a return to the, to the electoral college. Electoral college. And so on. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction? Uh, I will want to reserve that to the recommendations that will come out uh, till after quest, uh, Professor Boutre had done their recommendation because it is one subject area that they will be looking into and uh, uh, recommending the way forward. Now, General, how confident are you that the National Democratic Congress can come back to power? especially in 2020? Um, we haven't done one year yet in Nanado's government. And three and a half years is long enough politically for anything to happen. And so it is too early for anybody to conclude that we are either coming in 2020 or we are not coming <laughs> in 2020. But uh, <laughs> If things go according to what we are envisaging and we are planning, I'm reasonably confident that we can come back in 2020. You, but it's not going to be an easy tax. Let not anybody uh, delude themselves into thinking that uh, the mistakes of MPP will automatically catapult NDC into governance in 2020. It's not going to be easy tax. It will come with its own challenges. Every election is new in some respects. It's unique in some respects. So um, it depends on your preparation. You cannot say that the, uh, the armory with which you fought the previous election and won, and the strategy you use is going to suffice for the next battle ahead. So every election is unique in... in uh, in its own right. So let's wait, let's strategize, let's prepare, and let MPP also run the state. And when we are closer to the elections, we'll be able to predict fair, with some fair amount of certainty who will win the next election. Your assessment of the first 100 days of uh, the Akufuado government mm -hmm. was, was quite harsh. Oh. <laughs> Very, very harsh, uh, and it gave the impression that the government had virtually collapsed. Well, uh, you, 
usually expect that type of uh, reaction from an opposition party because uh, if we spend all the time talking about the good things about the government, then who talk about the bad sides? Because <laughs> everybody in MPP is talking about the good sides. So the people, we need to serve the people by bringing up the other side for the, the people to compare. So if you see us not concentrating too much on their successes, it is because there are already more than enough people talking about their successes. But and they, are they, are they, are they successes at all? Well, they are claiming they have successes. And so that, well, the things they refer to as successes <laughs> are really not successes. Because <laughs> if somebody says that uh, uh, I promise free education, I have repeated that promise and indicated that in September it will happen. And so therefore I list it as a success. I don't get it. <laughs> it is still a promise that has been repeated. Okay. And many of the things they talked about in their 110 successes are like that. We are going to do this and then you list it as a success. We will be doing this next year. Then you list it as a success now. I tend to think that they are either confused about the meaning of achievement <laughs> or they are out there to deceive uh, Ghanaians. But so far, I will commend their effort in clamping down on this uh, Galam Satan. It's a bold effort. They haven't succeeded yet, but I think it is a fight that is in the national interest. But is, is the focus of that campaign mm -hmm. correct? And when you create the impression that all of environmental degradation is caused by so-called illegal miners and small-scale miners, is that, is that a true picture? I'm not, I'm not worried about the nomenclature because when you hear them saying that we are not uh, clamping down on people who are doing mining legally, but we are clamping down on illegal miners. I don't see the difference, Kwesi. I have gone to um, areas that have been so badly degraded by this illegal mining. And I had the opportunity of flying with President Mahama during the campaigning and before the campaigning, and I, we flew over several places. In fact, if you do one round like that and you come home, you will sit down and wonder what the future of this country would be. Virtually all our water bodies have been polluted. I, because of my background as a social democrat, I always support things that are small scale rather than big businesses. Okay. But we must find a way of uh, doing it in such a way that we, 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 it can be environmentally sustainable because again as a social democrat we believe in environmental sustainability and so uh, we need to have a handle on that so far the i'm impressed about the noise that that has been the awareness that has been created we are yet to see how the actual implementation will turn out because I'm not sure uh, the intention is to drive everybody, every small scale miner away, but focus on who is doing mining wrongly, whether they are small scale or large scale. So uh, I wouldn't want them to just go after small scale miners when bigger companies are doing uh, are polluting in a bigger way so we must look at the problem as an environmental problem environmental challenge that needs to be addressed and so we fashion our methods to address them get the corporates whether there are large scale miners or small scale miners what is their impact on the environment and how are we going to correct that impact so that 
we can all be mining and engaging in our economic activities in a sustainable way. Now, sir, you, you were also quite unhappy about the fact that uh, the president appointed 110 ministers. They said that the job is big. So what's your problem? <laughs> they said the job is so big that they need a gigantic number of ministers to be able to do it. What's your problem? Sir? I think they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. They sort of uh, are creating an impression that they, 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 they don't know what the job of a minister is about. Okay. Ministers like managing directors are to t they are decision makers. So the job of a minister first and foremost is the uh, decision making. Okay. And so ministers are not the technical people who actually even undertake the work in the ministries. So the more ministers you appoint in the ministry, the more confusion you create there. Because you have a chief director. Elsewhere, when elections go into stalemate, some countries can stay, I mean, more than a year without a government. But the bureaucracy runs the system. Okay. So ministers are not the ones who go to do the work there. So if you want, uh, if you think the job is big, it is your thinking capacity that must be big. It is not <laughs> <laughs> the number of people. If you appoint several, uh, you know, people of average quality vis-a-vis one high quality person. One high quality person can do the work of 10, 10 people if uh, those 10 are of average, mm. <laughs> you know, intelligent IQ. So they got it wrong by thinking that if the job is big, then the number of ministers rather must be big. When you have people who actually do the work, who actually are supposed to do the work uh, in the streets, not getting jobs. So if, for instance, they've come to tell me that, well, we need more workers. So let us employ more fresh graduates, more, uh, you know, polytechnic graduates and so on, because we need more uh, people, more hands to do the work. It will be better understood than appointing ministers. It's like, uh, you know, a company that is collapsing. You yourself, by your own account, say the company is not performing then you do a review and your conclusion is that let us hire more managers and then sack more of the factory hands mm. <laughs> so that <laughs> you know to save their salary and then appoint more managers when the pay of one manager can employ more than 10 factory hands and the job gets done at the factory level so they've gotten uh, everything wrong again they're not talking about, I'm sure they're not doing the mathematics about the overhead cost. Okay. Uh, if you are producing things in a factory, the labor input of every worker is taken into account, the raw materials you use, everything, that gets the product manufactured. Mm -hmm. After you've gotten that one, at least you can quantify the sweat that a laborer puts into uh, getting this bottle of water, you can quantify the raw water that you use, the other chemicals, and so on. Then after that, you take the salaries of management, and then you say that is overhead, mm -hmm. and then you put it on the on the cost mm -hmm. of the thing. So if you are the, if you employ more laborers or more equipment and so on you get more bottles of water then. Mm -hmm. But if you employ more managers, they are there, and at the end of the day, they get higher pay, and then you quantify their, their salary, divide it, and put it as overhead on, on the bottle of water. So the more managers you get, the more expensive the product becomes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you, and when there is redeployment, as we are talking, there are places where the uh, ordinary workers are being redeployed and sacked. Those who threat is uh, leading into the production of the water. You are sacking them. So you leave a small number of workers to be doing the work that, uh, you know, the bigger number had been doing. And then you now go and employ, uh, you know, more managers. It doesn't make sense. If you quantify the cost of maintaining one minister in this country, you put it together and then multiply by 110. And this is the action taken by a president who is complaining that uh, there is debt, too much debt, is coming to do prudent uh, management to uh, you know, save the pace of the country, divert the resources into production. They are completely contradictory. His words are contradicting his actions so far, as far as these ministerial appointments are concerned. No matter what explanation they give, it doesn't convince anybody at all, because whatever you do, every minister will be given certain basic things to perform. They need offices, they need, uh, you know, vehicles, they need drivers, they need bodyguards, they need everyone. You put all this together, you think that, uh, to say the least, it doesn't make economic sense to get that number of ministers to be, to be handling the affairs of Ghana. Go, Ghana is like the size of UK. But their population is far, far bigger than Ghana. Go and take a look at the number of ministers who run a complex economy like UK. And then you come here and think that, uh, you know, everywhere you must have a, a minister. I was jokingly saying that there are 110. They need a few more ministers mm. to, qualify, to satisfy their mantra of uh, one district, one minister. How? Oh, the number, how many districts do we have? And so every district should know. get a minister. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how, that's the mantra. One district, one down, one district, one this, one this. So I'm sure they are heading towards one district, one minister. And yes, so there's something else that you haven't been very happy with, mm. at least on the uh, basis of the media report, mm. which is the 2.25 billion uh, 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 euro bond, you know, what is your problem with the with the euro bond? This is it's denominated in cities because and we pay in dollars and so on. What does all this mean? I will attempt to talk about it briefly because some aspects of it is in court and so on. So uh, you know, power interpreters like us, we don't know our limits when it comes to <laughs> contempt of court and other things are concerned. But briefly, our concern is that that type of transaction needed parliamentary approval. It didn't happen. And the rush with which that deal was struck also defied all the regulations of such an issue, which makes it suspicious. Um, the, the interest on that thing, it's also, in our view, way above what it should be. Because um, this uh, interest is related to the inflation rate in the country. Okay, interest rates generally in an economy are related to the uh, inflation rate and in the country. In the past, when the inflation was uh, uh, more than 20% thereabouts, we issued a similar bond at 18% interest rate. Now, as at the time these bonds were being issued, we are talking about an interest rate of between a little below 13%. Then you go and issue the bond at a rate close to two points 
above the 18 percent that we got when the interest rate was up, uh, you know above 20. It's clearly suspicious. Again, in that business, the longer the duration, at times the lower the interest rate. They issue two types of bonds. One that is, I think, 15 years, and the other that is uh, the 20 years or so. I mean, there was a, a, a difference. But interestingly, the rates for the two are the same, <laughs> 19 point something. So that thing is also curious. There was no road show, there was nothing. So there is everything to suggest that there's something wrong with that transaction. Not to talk about the personalities that are involved. Now it's been discovered that the, pers the personalities that are involved uh, creates a situation of conflict of interest and so on. So I wouldn't go into the details, but I think that there is justifiable cause for uh, the nation to call for some investigation or inquiry because we've done some calculation by the mathematics that i have mentioned if our inflation rate at that at the time we were issuing the 18 percent was close to 20 and we got it at 18. when it comes down to 13 percent at least it should come down some two, three percentage points. Now, if it happens that, uh, you know, it is the, the, the interest rate is padded by even two percentage points, the amount the nation will be losing, which may end up in private pockets, is huge. A two million dollars. It's huge, huge per year times 15 years, 20 years, thereabouts. It's not, it's, it's not a joke. Hmm. We are all looking for resources to build the economy, but this type of thing shouldn't pass without inquiry. We have to get into it. And I was surprised when, uh, in the face of such a big scandal, the president will find cause to commend the Minister of Finance in his May speech. Now for eliminating ghost, <laughs> ghost names from the payroll. No, no, but no ghost names, as far as we are concerned. Ghost names uh, uh, have not been eliminated yet. <laughs> because the story that we are hearing from what the president, from the president's account, and the account of the labor front, and so on, you cannot conclude about anything. Yes, you have a certain number of names. I hear 26,000 or whatever. A yeah, certain, more than 26,000. Mm -hmm. A certain number of names that were not found on the biometric database of SNIT. And you say that because these people have not registered with SNIT, you are not going to pay them. They are going to be classified as uh, ghosts. Now, when the announcement came, the labor unions protested. And the government went into an agreement with the labor union that you are extending the time and making provision for you know, those whose names have been deleted wrongly to be reinstated and all that. So why do you conclude that everybody whose name has been deleted it's, a, it's ghost. a ghost. If the same government which is making room for labor to now come and do the corrections is saying that whatever labor is going to do, irrespective of whatever they are going to do, they have made these savings and so they are proud, they are beating their chest that they've saved this amount. Doesn't it sound contradictory to you? So that is our problem. Well, General, we're going to go for another short break. And uh, when we come back, I would like you to take a look at your own government in power mm -hmm. and, and, and tell us, viewers, what your government managed to achieve.
was your government that incompetent? <laughs> and if it was not that incompetent, how come that, you know, all the things that happened, happened? Well, because we are in a conversation with General Mosquito, uh, Comrade Johnson Asedu Nketia, yes. General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, and we are talking about the national situation. We are having a conversation about the National Democratic Congress also. I'm going to go for a short break, and when we come back, we'd like to hear his assessment of his own government. Short break. How much is this? 600. Wonderful. I think I'll take this one. But um, what's your size? Uh, 44. This is 43. I can tell you 44. That's good. This is the man, your home of quality shoes from the UK. We have various shoes for the office, for your formal and casual occasions. Visit the man in Abilengpe. Our office is located just behind Aquatech. Our telephone numbers are 020-873-7166. You can also reach us on our landline 0302-730-760. We'll be expecting you. Well, welcome back to Talk Time, and uh, the man in the seat is Mr. Johnson Asedu Nketia, General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress. Now, sir, you are in power for eight years. Your assessment? Well, I wouldn't say that we did everything perfectly, but I'm proud of our achievement in the past eight years. Um, and so even after our electoral defeat, I'm sure as we sit here now, people, some people are expressing regret for voting against us. The stage of development where we found Ghana required that certain areas of development must be emphasized. And it didn't matter whether you are socialist, you are capitalist, you are social democrat, or whatever. If you are running an economy where there is no water for everybody. No matter your ideological orientation, you must find the water first. You must focus on getting the water. We are running an economy where the roads are that bad. No matter your ideological orientation, you need to fix the roads. If you have people who have to go to school and there are no schools, you need to provide the schools. So I would say that in our part of the world, it becomes very difficult to actually undertake policy interventions that, that cuts you out clearly as a social democratic government vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, um, capitalists and so on and so forth. And over all this, you and I know that <laughs> we have our hands in the mouth of the Western world. So that also places some limitations of policy you are able to undertake. Mm -hmm. So having said this, I would say that the NDC government, both under Professor Mills and uh, under President Mahama, has done commendably well. When you take education, you realize when we came, the emphasis was, I mean, we went around and the, 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 the most stacking problem was that schools were being run under trees, 
many many schools in urban communities were doing shift because of lack of classrooms mm -hmm. and so on so there was some concentration on providing school infrastructure in fact the policy was like the, the, the title elimination of schools under trees mm -hmm. later some people came out to say that oh but we could still see some school <laughs> here which is under 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 a tree and that is a vindication that after all you identified with mm -hmm. that policy intervention otherwise you wouldn't go around looking for certain schools and also population growth and the provision of um, educational infrastructure is a continuous activity okay so if you have 100 schools on the trees today and you are working to eliminate them uh, within a period of say two years and so on mm -hmm. by the time you get to the uh, you know the end of the second year those who were four years would have achieved the age of mm -hmm. six years now and they also requires schools so if you are not able to clear the backlog and also whilst clearing the backlog making provision for those who are growing up mm -hmm. then uh, you are like on a wild goose chase by the time you finish eliminating hundred some 20 <laughs> or have cropped up but that doesn't mean that the activity of providing educational infrastructure for uh, uh, school children was misplaced so we did very well in that area and because of that i'm sure uh, i don't have the statistics here but there was a good uh, increase in the number of uh, the percentage of um, uh, children of school going age getting access to education um, when uh, President Mahama also came in fact during the campaign the issue of free uh, SHS came out and we said that look, it would be unfair we are social democrats and we think that um, it would be unfair to jump into straight into free education when access to majority of students is not available so if you have 49 in those days or so 48 49 percent of people who qualify to enter shs uh, only 49 or 48 getting admission and you have 51 52 not getting admission because of lack of uh, uh, space. space and you prioritize the payment of school fees for the 48 percent when you don't have money to provide for access for the 52 percent then we think that it will be misplacement of priorities so whilst everybody wanted um, you know to reduce to make education affordable it must be situated in policy that is just and fair to everybody because the resources that you are going to use to provide the free education is contributed by everybody including the parents of the 52 percent who don't have access so we thought that it is not an either or issue but it should be uh, whilst you are doing this you must be doing something else mm. so instead of jumping into full-scale free shs we think that even as other we are providing access to others to to enter there are still some who have access but because of the economic circumstances of their background it becomes very difficult for them to continue and you cannot ask them to wait for you to build all the schools for the 52 percent before you come and uh, take care of them because they are also growing mm -hmm. so that's why we introduce uh, a progressive introduction of free shs whilst we expanded the educational infrastructure and we didn't do badly at all on that i'm sure that now if you work the figures it will, it will favor 
a majority having access and minority in there, even though we haven't uh, got, uh, gotten there. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly, those who were criticizing us for the progressive introduction and were all over the place, it must be instant and now and total and so on, they themselves haven't gone around and around. They are now talking about the progressive. Because if you say you are going to introduce free SHS in uh, September, and it will cover only a session of the student population. How different is it from the progressive thing? So after all, it was a hoax. They just use it to deceive people for votes. So uh, these events make us feel vindicated about our policy choices. Like, after all, a progressive introduction mm -hmm. is, is the best thing. We're doing the best thing. I don't know how they are going to follow through with the completion of the uh, infrastructure we were providing. That will be a subject for uh, another discussion. When you come to the area of water, that too, we have performed so well. The provision of what, potable water, both for urban populations and the rural populations, saw massive increase. Now, as we, uh, as I speak now, the uh, the water that has been processed or that is processed daily from Pong has so increased that if we are able to lay all the pipelines in Adenta, Medina, or Yarifa, those areas, then water problem will be a thing of the past in the northern part of Accra. We have at least built the infrastructure. The water is available to be distributed. So we are hoping that uh, this government will, will follow up and then make sure that the distribution lines are laid and then to uh, get uh, you know, all those households there provide water. So in the area of water production, we have done well. So in spite of, in all, of, electricity, the, in spite of all of this electricity, water, mm. you know, uh, education so on. How come that the opposition then labeled your government as incompetent? Well, they are now going to prove their own competence. <laughs> you see, <laughs> as they, they, they move along in their government, we have opportunity to compare what they do with what we have done, and then we give the judgment to the masses. To determine which is competent. For instance, when they ended up with 110 ministers, I came out to say that, well, if there's a job which maybe 77 people, 80 people can do, and then another person requires 110 people to do that same job, if you are talking about in, uh, uh, competence, which of these two <laughs> would you describe as competent? You understand? So it's not about what they say. They had a lot of access to the media and they, they are able to, you know, produce fake news to support their campaigning and so on. And, you know, people want to hear things that are sweet. When you say, I'm going to give you free, I'm going to give you free, I'm going to give you this thing free. People want to hear that one. And then another person is saying that, well, we are in a difficult situation at the, this stage of our development. We must uh, bear certain sacrifices so that we can uh, uh, project the nation uh, into a certain situation that will help our children and our great-grandchildren. They don't care about you. Like the ladies have been saying, they say, the men, some come and they say, oh, there be there be a baby here. And another person comes, a baby or her. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Mm -hmm. The ways will go for the, the person. Uh, Abe or her. Abe or her means it's ready now. Come. Come and chop. Come and chop. So they apply the same. So it's just about the, the sweetness of their messages. That created a thing. And I'm sure that as they perform, uh, increasingly Ghanaians will come to realize that they have been taken for a ride. A typical example is the DKM scandal in, in uh, Brongafo. Wow. When we were going to all lengths to explain to them 
the implications of that investment and the fact that it wasn't possible to just go and take taxpayers' monies to go and pay people who have done their private investments uh, and have landed into a certain difficult situation. Whether it is fair for us to take everybody's money to go and pay. So the laws provide for how we can liquidate the assets of that company and be able to pay from mm -hmm. it. They say, oh, no, 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 no. We are paying just in January. If you vote for us, we are paying in January. They voted for them. Now the, their, their answer is that uh, it is not in our manifesto. So we are not going to pay. We are going to try to liquidate the, the assets of that company as NDC was doing so we can, we can pay. You understand? So because of the level of literacy and other things and the fact that human beings don't like suffering. So anything that pinches, if you are passing them through a, a bumpy situation and somebody is pro, uh, promising a smooth ride, clearly they will go for it if they don't know the implications of, uh, you know, their action. It can, it, it can create that, that type of uh, situation. So, but the good thing is that they will test MPP on every promise they have made and they will come to realize that we're doing uh, the best things for them after all. Uh, as we sit now, they were talking about uh, health insurance, this thing, uh, nurses, we haven't employed nurses, and we said that, look, we have made the biggest expansion in health infrastructure since independence during this, our eight-year period. So if you are providing the hospitals, for heaven's sake, we are not going to employ butchers to be working there. We will be employing nurses. Okay. So somebody who is providing the employment opportunities, and you can see fairly, fairly that these things have been provided. And so uh, we are not going to leave the hospitals there as a white elephant project. We are eventually going to employ nurses. So give us some time, we'll finish and employ you. They say, no, we will employ everybody who has completed nursing training. What are we seeing now? Nurses are still picketing there and so on. So they are talking now that they've been taking for a ride. Our decision to abolish the, uh, you know, uh, abolish the allowances and convert them into student loans and so on. The nurses, uh, leadership, they are now saying that they made a mistake in, 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 in challenging that. The teachers, trainee teachers' leadership are saying the same thing. You know, but if you call on them, that look, it is better to use the money that is available to expand access, so that many many people who are roaming the streets, who qualify to be trained as teachers, can have access to go and 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 uh, become teachers, rather than keeping the money and keeping the. Uh, access restricted to a few people and using the money to pay that few. The end result is that you are not going to be able to fill your classrooms with teachers because you are restricting the assets. So if the, the element that is a hindrance is the allowance, let us remove it and then expand the assets. After all, We've also converted the train, training colleges into tertiary institutions. And there are other tertiary institutions that are training teachers and they are on student loan. So for purposes of equity, why do you expect that people in Winneba University, Cape Coast University, and other places, Mampong and other places, training the same teachers should uh, now we should not be paying allowances. Mm -hmm. They are taking uh, student loans. And then 38 teacher training colleges which have been upgraded into tertiary institutions, they will be uh, uh, taking allowances. So when you come to look at equity and uh, national interest, getting more teachers to fill the classrooms because you and I know that for us, 
uh, socialists and social democrats we rather would want everybody having basic education than to be paying money to uh, a small number of people in tertiary institutions so the the allowance was like killing several birds with one stone the removal of the allowance rather increase the intake of the training colleges and so between last year this year and perhaps next year the number of teachers who will come out and be available to fill the basic schools will be high now i'm told that with the the new system they are going to cut admissions by 60 percent so that you'll be able to pay <laughs> the 40 percent that you'll be employed does that make sense to you Percy? Well, sir, thank you very much for You're coming, welcome. and it's been a pleasure having you in, in, in our studio. You're welcome. Well, viewers, this is where we draw the curtains on talk time, and we were particularly privileged to have Mr. Johnson Asidun Ketia, General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, in our studio. We hope that he's been able to clarify a few things, or, or many things, and uh, we hope to have him again for part two of this sure. program because it does appear that he has a lot to say, a lot more to say. So on behalf of the production crew, on behalf of the cameraman, the director, Mr. Yevu, and, and everybody here at Pan African, we'd like to say goodbye to you until we meet again next week. Bye-bye.